Hello again. This is lectures one and two from ILEC 352, Engineering Management and Entrepreneurial Skills. So we've already gone through a module overview. Now we're going to look at the first couple of topics. So there's going to be a little bit of a more in-depth overview, introducing the, the topic of engineering management, and then we'll start talking about how the module is going to be structured, what I expect of you, what you should expect of me, and the first couple of tasks. So the first thing, project management. It's not perhaps something you've studied before and it's not something you might expect to study an engineering degree, but it's really important. So what is it? And why do you need to study it? So society isn't what it was 50 or 100 years ago. Society is evolving and developing more rapidly now than ever before. And the pace of this uh, increase in uh, knowledge and um, scientific know-how means we need to process this knowledge in a different way from uh, how we used to manage it in the past. So simply concentrating on engineering tasks and engineering problems isn't enough. Now we need to think about engineering as part of uh, the larger context in society. So we need to think about engineering engineers solving problems, not individually, but as part of teams working together within companies to complete projects. And throughout this module, we'll be focusing on these three things which I've highlighted, performance, time, and cost. And it's these three things which a project manager or an engineering manager needs to manage. So it's not just the, the mathematics, it's not just the functionality, it's not just the uh, performance, it's the time, the time it takes to develop it, the time it takes to bring it to market, and the cost. How much does it cost to develop it, and at what, um, at what price point will it be brought to market? So an awareness of all these things is necessary, it's needed by a modern engineer. So, any project will have objectives, and these will typically be specified in terms of performance, time, and cost. And an engineer needs to be able to meet these objectives by planning, organizing, and scheduling. So scheduling is for the time, organizing and planning is for the performance and the cost. So they need to be able to use their resources, whatever is available to you, human resources, technical resources, financial resources, all of these we will, um, we will touch on in this module. So nothing in this module will we look at in any particular depth, but we will spend a few minutes talking about most of the concepts and topics, ideas and tools that you'll need as an engineering manager. So the whole idea, the whole field of project management, it's um, almost 100 years old. So it came out of um, the military and it was adopted by the construction industry. So I won't read these slides that you can read yourself. Uh, I will give you some pointers to some references online and some material that I've put up on uh, the VLE for you. And I'll uh, leave you to pursue this in your own time. I'll try to focus on uh, those uh, topics, skills, ideas and concepts that you will need to pass this module. And I'll focus on the tasks that will be assessed. Okay, so again, you might be asking yourself, why am I studying this? This isn't a technical uh, subject, it's not related to mechatronics, avionics, communications, electronics, why do I need to study it? Well, you need to study it because the moment you leave Liverpool University, the, the moment you, you get your first job, you'll be working with a team of other people. Some of them will be engineers, some won't. And you'll need to deliver some kind of project. 
So you'll need to know how projects are specified. What are objectives? How do we analyze these things? How do we schedule the activities to make these things happen? So you'll need to speak that language and you'll need to know how your learning, how your technical knowledge can, can be brought into the world through the, um, the, the tools available in the modern um, workplace. So your degree program includes at least one project. So if you're in your third year now, you'll be doing a third year project, ELEC 340, a 30 credit project. And you'll need to manage that and you'll need to plan that. And there are resource implications and there are scheduling implications. And there are performance implications. So everything that we cover in this module, or a lot of what we cover in this module, is directly relevant to your final year project. So, success in this module will make you a better project student. So it'll help you in your final year project. But it'll also make you a better engineer, a more employable engineer. So our graduates, students who've left and gone on to get graduate jobs, many of them have come back and have told us that of all the subjects they, stu they, they studied at Liverpool, it's the management module that best prepared them for work um, in, uh, in industry. So it's really helped them kickstart their career. So don't uh, underestimate the value of what you're going to learn in this module. So, a little introduction to the module. This is a strange way to start, but I'm not going to be teaching you about project cost and risk management, even though I suggested I would be, I won't. I will be introducing you to some of these topics. I will be telling you about the tools, the techniques, the formulas that are used um, uh, in project cost and risk management. But the actual learning, it's not going to happen by teaching. It'll happen by you actually carrying out these things. Not only in your final year project, but as a project as part of this module. So we're going to create, we're going to be working together, or you will be working together on a virtual project. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But in that project, you will learn these critical skills, which really can't, can't be taught. So it's, it's like programming or riding a bike. You can't be taught how to communicate, how to budget, how to do risk management. You can't be taught leadership or planning. You can be told the essentials, you can be given the tools, but you actually develop these skills through practical experience. And the project that you'll be doing together will give you the opportunity to do that. So, most modules you will study in the form of a number of lectures and a written exam. And this is a possibility. ELEC 352 could be taught in this way. It's just I don't think it would be particularly helpful to you. It would mean remembering a lot of material and then um, regurgitating that in, in an exam. Option B is to learn through group work, through seminars, through workshops, and through open, then uh, have open book class tests to assess your knowledge. So rather than expect you to remember things and then set an exam, open book test where you have access to all the material, and then you just use that knowledge, use what you've learned in an open book test. So option B, that's what we're going with. So in the past, this module, modules like this, were taught using option A, but it's not a, it's not a successful model. I don't think students liked it. Students didn't do particularly well at it. It favoured people who were, had good memories, right, were good um, at writing, had good English skills, and disadvantaged people who were perhaps um, less able to remember and maybe had weaker English or they were slower in writing. But group B, um, so far has been very successful. 
So it's, it's very, very difficult to fail this module. Most people get marks in the high 60s, high 70s. So ELEC 352 is an opportunity to do very well and to raise your average mark. So this is really repeating what we've just said, that what we're going to do is um, form project teams and then plan, manage, and report on a virtual project. And this is how you'll learn these skills. You'll develop them yourself by working together on this project. So what is it we're trying to achieve? The desired learning outcomes. Again, I don't want to bore you with the details. I'm giving you a reference to a couple of papers. Some of these and more are available on uh, the VLE for you to download and browse at your leisure, but I want to focus on what you'll be doing. So, your virtual project. This is what we'll be working on. So it's a, um, a fictional project where you have a dinosaur park. It's not a dinosaur theme park, it's an actual dinosaur park. And your job is to work as a team or as teams to analyze, plan and manage the construction of this, this park. It's called a theme park, but it's an actual um, dinosaur park. Okay, so it's called Triassic World. I didn't make this up, by the way, so I, I inherited this part of the uh, module. So this is the brief. So this is, this is the brief. Your company has purchased an island there's some information about the island. There's the handbook full of all the details. I'm not going to talk you through the details, but the handbook gives you all the details about um, the project. So your team has been assigned a specific construction task. So these are the tasks. So there are 10 different tasks. You will be assigned one of these, depending on your project number. And then you have 16 weeks to actually complete the construction. So that's not 16 real world weeks in the module. This is 16 weeks in the hypothetical world, the imaginary world of this project. So it's very, very fast. So 16 weeks, we're talking about less than four months. This whole thing has to be completed. So by doing this, I hope you will learn the fundamentals of project management, risk management, and cost management. You'll be applying what you learn in the lectures in your uh, project. And this will be assessed by a series of tasks. There are five phases and five tasks, but the tasks will be numbered one, two, and three. So tasks two and three each have an A and B component. So in total, five tasks. Okay, so the first task will look at situational analysis and objectives. We'll look at program, work program planning and scheduling. Then we'll look at critical path analysis, which is related to scheduling. Then risk analysis and management and cost analysis and management. Okay, so this is the first task, situational analysis. Work program planning and critical path analysis, that's the second task. And the last two, risk and cost, that's your third task. So three tasks in total. So, a few things about the module. It isn't difficult, okay? A few principles and applications. Nothing is going to be taken in particular depth. We're going to be looking at everything fairly superficially. We'll spend a few moments looking at each uh, concept. There are a few equations you need to learn. You need to know how to um, carry out a few calculations. You need to understand the distinction between a few things. There are a few processes that you need to understand. You need to learn how to draw a few things, but it's really easy. I say pass rate is greater than 90%. It's actually 100%. Okay, A couple of people have failed um, uh, in the past few years, but these are people who um, either dropped out or didn't submit any work. So if, if you follow the lectures, if you work in your groups, you will not only pass, you will do really well. So what are you going to be doing? It's lectures you'll be attending, and you'll be doing that online. So these are the um, pre-recorded lectures. 
You'll be doing the virtual project as a team, and you'll be completing these three tasks as teams, working in groups. To do that, you need to attend workshop sessions. So these are virtual sessions where you guys meet together. Okay. You'll be doing the careers and employability activities, and timing is all on the schedule on the VLE. So I've put up a schedule with all the course uh, work deadlines from week one and to, until week um, uh, 11. So it's really um, fast paced module. So you will have noticed that there is something happening almost every week. There's a deadline. There are two deadlines in week two, a deadline in week three, deadlines in week four, six, seven. So almost every week there is a deadline. Now, in addition to the tasks, in addition to the careers and employability activities that I introduced in the module overview, and I'll give you more information about this as we get closer to the time, there will be two um, assessments, two formal exams. Now, these are online class tests, one in week six and one in week 11. Not week 111, week 11. Okay, so these are two class tests that you'll need to prepare for. So they're open book, but they're timed tests. So you all do them together at a specific time. So really, as you know, open book tests can be difficult, simply because the time you waste flipping through the different lecture notes um, means that in practice, unless you're really well prepared for the test, uh, the fact that it's open book isn't necessarily helpful. Okay. And the final thing about um, what you'll be doing is every single task comes with a deadline. And there is zero tolerance in these deadlines. So in other modules, you might have uh, a lateness penalty that allows you to submit late and have a 5% a uh, deduction per day. That doesn't apply to the tasks in ELEC 352. So everything needs to be submitted on time. Because in the real world, in industry, that's how projects need to happen. If they're submitted a minute late, they'll be rejected. So if you want to do well in this module, don't leave things till the last minute. Don't upload your work one minute to midnight, and then when it crashes or when it, your internet connection dies or when you're unable to get your work in on time, you then complain that you've missed the deadline because I will have zero sympathy towards that and there will be zero tolerance towards that. If you miss a deadline, it's an immediate zero. So at the end of the module, so this is sort of the objectives, this is what we're trying to achieve. So at the end of the module, you should be able to define the meaning of common terms associated with management. I won't read through these. You can read through these in your own time. But these are the, um, uh, the learning objectives. So this and the next two slides go through the learning objectives in phases. So for project management, these are eight or nine things you need to do. For costing, this is what I want you to do. So you, you, will, you will have some knowledge of these terms. So payback, net present value, discounted cash flow, DCF, order costing, continuous costing, all these different ways of calculating cost. You will have some understanding of this. Not a great, uh, not in any depth, but you'll have enough understanding to be able to deal with it if uh, it ever comes up. So these are the costing learning objectives. And finally, the professional skills learning objectives, those um, skills valued by employers, these are the things which, uh, or this is, this is a subset of those things which I expect you all to learn as a result of this. So being able to manage tasks and meetings, being able to communicate, to demonstrate your understanding, to communicate your understanding, to use certain packages like Microsoft Project, to evaluate your performance through self-assessment, to evaluate other people's performance through peer assessment or peer moderation. All of these things um, come into the realm of professional skills. 
So the ELEC 352 module overview, where have we seen this before? So the, this was uh, the, the very first lecture where I talked you through what we're doing. So here we have uh, our first lecture, which we're, we're doing today. And this is the lecture track. So all of these lectures at the top will be pre-recorded. The next row, the workshops, these happen um, every other week. Okay, you can meet more frequently if you like, because, but these workshops will be workshops that you will be taking part in. These are led by yourselves. And you have these class tests. So this, the weighting of these, they add up to um, 80%. So you've got your three 15% for each of the tasks, then you've got 15% for the first class test and 20% for the second class test. So the remaining 20% will be the careers and employability activity. So there's the SMART objectives, so-called task zero, this one at the top in purple. So SMART objectives, task zero, I'll talk to you about that today because the deadline is this week. You have a video interview worth 5%, a commercial awareness or digital storytelling worth 10%, and then a, a, two questionnaires that you need to, to, to fill out. So these are really easy marks. These are just things you can do, enjoy, learn from, and collect easy marks. And many of them are either self-assessed, where you mark yourself, or they're peer-assessed, where you mark for your peers, you mark for someone else. So it's really easy to do very well, but you have to take it seriously. So what do you need to do to pass this module? You've been recruited to a project team with a company specializing in the development and construction of dinosaur theme parks. This is your virtual project task. Again, I won't read this to you. You can read the handbook, download the handbook and go through that. But basically over the next um, uh, semester, so over the next 16 weeks, you need to do the construction. This is in the role play, in the hypothetical project. But in the real world, over the, over the next uh, nine to ten weeks, you need to actually uh, complete the three tasks. So you need to meet with your team at least once every week. If you haven't yet joined a team, you need to do that as soon as possible. We'll talk about how to do that in a minute. But you need to meet with your team regularly. It's probably once or twice a week. You need to have um, documentation for each of these meetings. You need to have an agenda and minutes for each meeting. And I've uploaded already examples of what these might look like. In each task, you need to submit along with the agenda and the minutes. Now, working within a team, each of you needs to take on a role. So there'll be a project manager and there'll be a secretary. And every team has to have these two roles. And because you're going to be doing three tasks, and if we break these tasks down, there are five in total, because tasks two and three have two components. So there are five in total and there are five members per team. It means each of you will take turns in being the project manager. So everybody will be the project manager on one project and the secretary on another. So the project manager is responsible for the final project, final task, and the submission of that task. But you all need to upload a copy of the assignment. So there's five people working together. All five people will have identical submissions, okay? So the five people working in one group will have identical submissions. So I'm not going to mark all five, I'll just mark the project managers. But that means you all need to upload a copy of the assignment. If anybody doesn't upload their copy of the assignment by the deadline, they get a zero. 
if you upload a copy which isn't identical to that of the project manager, if it's different in any way, you get a zero. If the project manager doesn't upload the document, if the project manager misses the deadline, the whole team gets a zero. Okay? So I'll say that one more time. It's really important. Everybody needs to submit identical copies of their reports on time to the VLE. So a group of five people means five identical submissions. Only the project manager's submission is going to be marked and everybody else will share that mark. But if the project manager misses the deadline, everybody in the group gets a zero. If the project manager uploads the work, but you miss the deadline, then you will get a zero. If you upload your work on time, but it's different from that of the project manager, you get a zero. You see, so it's really easy to get a zero, but it's really easy to do well as well. So, I said you would all share the mark of the project manager, but that isn't technically accurate. Because after marking, we're going to go through a process called peer moderation. I will ask each of you, how much did you contribute to the group's effort? And how much did everyone else contribute? And you each get a chance to rate everyone else in your team. So that means that if someone is particularly active, someone did most of the work in the group, they will get a higher mark. And if someone didn't attend most of the meetings or was silent, wasn't particularly active, didn't do much of the work, that person will lose marks. Okay, so it's 50% it's of the marks mark variability. So the mark can go up or down by 50%. So if you don't want to be penalized, work hard throughout the module. Okay, if you just take it easy, act as a passenger, leave everything else, leave all the work to someone else, you will be disappointed. And if you are the project manager, and all of you, each of you will become a project manager at some point, if you're the project manager, make sure you don't let your team down. Every year, there is at least one project manager who misses the deadline. What happens is the whole team gets a zero. And that's non-negotiable. There is zero tolerance for this. If you miss a deadline, you get a zero. If you're a project manager and you miss a deadline, the whole team gets a zero. So I make it very easy to do very well on this module. But it is easy to get a zero. So just make sure that doesn't happen to you. Plan ahead, submit early. Always submit a few days before the deadline. So, so what's available to us? The vital site. Lots of resources there. I'm sure you've seen it already. I won't waste um, time reading this to you. There are some references. These are references you can either buy, get from the library, download, some of these I've put links on VITAL, and there are some more documents on VITAL for you to access. Okay, you can read these rules. The second point applies when we're all in a lecture theatre together, less so in a virtual environment. Okay. Remember I said you need to upload everything to the deadline. So one second after the deadline, the upload link will disappear. And there's nothing I can do about bringing it back. So make sure you do everything on time. If you have questions, the best way to get them answered is not to send an email because I won't, I won't be able to reply to emails. Use the, use the discussion board. If you use the discussion board, then other people in the group other people 
on the module can answer or I can answer, but everybody gets to see the response. Okay, and the workshop sessions, these are going to be synchronous, these are going to be live, I will be there and I can take questions and I can help you all throughout the module. Okay, now we're going to start talking about the actual project. So when we talk about project management, what do we mean? What is a project? A project, it's not just what you're doing in ELEC 340, your final year project. A project is, is something that you do with a particular purpose, an objective. It has to have a start and it has to have an end and it must resolve some conflict of interest. So the, the characteristics of a project, it should have a purpose. You want to achieve something. For example, in this module, ELEC 352, you're trying to learn about something. It has to have a life cycle. So for example, it started last week and it'll end in January. That's the life cycle of the project. It didn't exist before October and it won't exist after January as far as you're concerned. Okay, and it has phases, so week one, week two, week three. Interdependencies with other activities. For example, it might relate to something you've learned before. It might The life cycle of a project goes through five phases. So it could be your final year project. It could be the project that you're working on. It doesn't all happen in one burst. It starts slowly, then it builds up towards the peak, and then it declines and it ends. But it has to have a start and it has to have an end. So the very start it's called the conception. It's where the project is still in its nascent form. It's still in, in the form of ideas. It's still an idea that someone is exploring. There's not much activity. There could be some planning, some thought, some discussion, but it's still just an idea. Then you select what you're actually going to do, how you're going to do it, then you start planning, scheduling, monitor. This is where all the build-up happens. This is the busy period. Then there's an evaluation and termination phase. So if you just think about your final year project, the conception was probably the week that you actually were given the list of project titles and you were going through them one by one and thinking about them. Or it might have been when your project supervisor actually thought this up last year in this, or over the summer. They thought up some titles and put them down um, online. So that was the conception stage. Selection stage is where you select the project or the project supervisor selects you or an agreement happens between the two of you. Then you start deciding what you're going to do. But the moment you start deciding what you're going to do, that's where you start planning, okay? How much am I going to do before Christmas? How much after Christmas? How much is it going to cost? Do we have the resources? How many, uh, what other people are going to be involved, etc. How am I going to check that it's actually working? This is the build up. So this is what's going to happen November, December. The activity probably reaches a peak in February where you're ready to deliver. You're, at, you're actually So project-based working allows you to structure your activity into a portfolio of individual but connected projects that together allow you better control, shorter development times, higher quality and reliability, sharper orientation towards results, identification and correction of problems at an early stage, and delivery of the specified outcomes. Does that make sense? Think about it in terms of something you're familiar with. 
It could be a barbecue you are planning or a hike or a holiday. It could be your final year project. Just think about how breaking it down into individual smaller little activities and projects allows you greater control, shorter development times, higher quality and reliability. Think about a large construction company and think about how this would help. If it isn't clear, it will become clearer over the course of the module. We're now going to say a few words about organizational structures. Okay, this is how project activity is based. Now we're going to go through a few slides, not in great depth. There are whole books written about organizational structures. We're going to cover it all in less than 10 minutes. So an organization is a social arrangement to achieve a controlled performance in pursuit of some collective goals. So it could be a football club, it could be a hospital or university, it could be a, a multinational company. All of these are organizations. So it's some arrangement where we're trying to achieve something. And we're going to be talking about how these organizations are structured. So organizational structure is how these organizations are structured. So hierarchical arrangement. So OS, when we say OS, we're talking about organizational structure. So roles, powers, and responsibilities are assigned, controlled, and coordinated. So when we say OS, or organizational structure, we are describing the hierarchy of um, responsibilities, roles, power, um, activities, basically. Okay, so think about your own family. Think about any company that you're, you, you're familiar with. Think about the university that you go to. And think about what kind of relationships there are between the different components. And how information flows between the different levels of management. Who speaks to who and who is accountable to who. So there are many types. We're going to look at some of the most common ones. Functional OS. Project OS, Matrix OS, and Hybrid OS. Okay, so the least common is the functional OS. So pure functional OS isn't very common. So this is what organizations might have looked like a hundred years ago. So you would have directors beneath them you would have different um, uh, different uh, categories so human resources and finance and then you'd have your different uh, groupings you'd have marketing say engineering purchasing production so imagine this as a company that's manufacturing something some let's say they're making um, so, some kind of um, uh, some some technical gadget so you've got a team working on marketing the marketing team has a marketing manager, and the marketing manager has marketing staff. The engineering team have an engineering manager and engineering staff. The same with the purchasing and the production teams. All of them are responsible to the directors of the company, and the human resources and finance are common for the entire organization. That's not a particularly efficient way of organizing uh, a uh, uh, of structuring an organization, I should say, there are better ways to do it. So this is a pure project. So a project OS. In a project OS, you still have the directors at the top, but the directors, the work is arranged by project. So you have different projects. Let's say you have th three projects happening at the same time. So you've got project A, B, and C. Each project will have its own project manager. And then each project manager will have their own marketing, their own engineering, their own production, and their own purchasing staff. 
So this is very different from the functional um, OS in the previous slide. Again, it's not very efficient, is it? You can imagine this is how the military would operate, but it doesn't make sense to have an engineering staff and marketing staff for Project A, an engineering staff and marketing staff for Project B, an engineering staff and marketing staff for Project C. Why don't the same marketing staff work for all three projects? And that's what you'll find in the next OS. So in a matrix OS, it looks like the functional OS, doesn't it? Where you have director, then you have human resources and finance, then you have your different groupings, marketing, engineering, purchasing and production, and then you have your managers and your staff. But we call it a matrix because each project can then borrow staff from each of the different departments. So project A will take staff from the marketing department, engineering department, purchasing department, and production department. Project B will do the same. Maybe at this time, project C doesn't exist. Over time, project B might wind down there might be less activity, they might require less resources and less staff, and Project C might be starting up. So Project C can start taking over some of the staff from Project B. So some marketing staff, some engineering staff, from purchasing, purchasing staff, etc. They can start um, working for Project C. So the staff can move between projects, but they will be limited to their own functional grouping. So somebody working for engineering will continue to work for engineering, but they can move between their different projects. Okay, so think about where you might have seen a uh, structure like this. When you next apply for a company and you do a little bit of research about the company, think about their organizational structure. and Think about where would you work? And would you be l linked to one project? Like in a... Um, in a uh, in a project, a pure project um, OS? Or would it be more like a matrix OS? The final um, OS we'll be covering today is something called a hybrid OS. Now in a hybrid OS, again, you have the directors at the top and you have, say, human resources and finance. So these are examples, the, the, the boxes don't have to have directors and human resources and finance, but th these are very common examples. So a hybrid is uh, similar to um, a matrix OS, but it has elements of uh, project uh, OS in it as well. So for example, look at uh, project A and look at project Project A has a project manager and has its dedicated staff, and so does Project B. But if you look at the marketing, engineering, purchasing, and production, they still have the um, matrix arrangement where you can still have um, Project C cutting across them all. So a hybrid is sort of a mixture between project, functional, and so hybrid organization, such as our university, most universities, they have functional elements like faculties, departments, finance office, human resources, etc. And they have project elements like our new electrical engineering building planned for 2023, or the refurbishing the student union project, or a research project or admissions and clearing. So we have projects, and these projects have start dates and end dates, but we also have functional elements. So we, we are very much a hybrid organization. We have projects, but we also have functional elements. Okay, project selection, modeling, and evaluation. So, an organization will have a long-term strategic plan that includes several strategic objectives. The strategic objectives are 
sort of the long term things we want to happen. So a company might want to become the leading supermarket in the UK or a company might want to introduce a new vehicle to become the market leader. This isn't going to happen overnight. It's not something that's going to happen in a couple of years, but this is a long term strategic plan. Now, senior management will consider a range of possible projects to achieve these strategic objectives. Now, sometimes senior management will have different options. They'll have three different ways of achieving their strategic plan, and they'll need to, pre they'll need to select, they'll need to choose which project will achieve these objectives in the best possible way. Now, when I say the best possible way, it could mean um, with the least cost. It could mean um, in the shortest time. It could mean uh, in the most politically expedient fashion. There are many uh, criteria one could use, but it's important to be able to select the most appropriate project. And to do that, you don't, project managers or senior managers, they don't rely on their gut feeling. They use models, decision aiding models, to extract relevant issues of a problem and then summarize them, allow them to, to make these decisions. And some of these models are quantitative, some are qualitative. Let, let's have a look at a few of these. So what is a model? Model is just a way of representing some aspect of a problem, situation, or a plan. So in this, in this case, it'll be a project. So it allows vital facts to be communicated, understood, and evaluated. Now, a model isn't reality. So by definition, if we're trying to represent some aspect of reality, we are distorting reality. But we're doing it in order to represent something that is important, some relevant fact. So it's a distortion of reality. So for example, here we have a map of central London. Is it real? No. Is it a distortion of reality? Of course it's a distortion. It looks nothing like central London. But it's useful. If I want to be able to plan my route from one end of London to the other, if I want to be able to see um, or to measure a distance, if I want to see which, uh, you know, who, which train station is closest to Hyde Park, a map is very useful. So it's a model, it's a useful model, but we have to acknowledge that it is a distortion. So a model is a me method used to represent important aspects. But models, they don't make the decision it's people who make the decisions. And the comment I added there is that increasingly AI, artificial intelligence, so computer models, are so, uh, computer algorithms are using the models to make decisions, or at least to, to recommend decisions for people to make, or sometimes just making those decisions on behalf of people. Okay, so the models are really important. So these decision aiding models we're talking about, some are qualitative, some are quantitative. So some are numeric, some depend on numbers, and some aren't numeric. So numeric models, they give you cold, hard facts. They give you numbers. So for example, a model might give you something called the payback period. Okay. That's a period measured in months or in years, but that, that's a number. An average rate of return, that's a number. A discounted cash flow, internal rate of return, profitability index. So we'll be looking at all of these, so I don't want to waste your time looking at them now, but just to know that these are numbers. And a project manager or a senior manager in selecting a project will often look at these numbers and determine which project to go with. So they'll look at profitability index and say project A, project B, project C. Based on profitability index, we should go with project A, but based on payback period, we might go with project B. And then depending on 
which of these is more important, they would then um, make a decision. But we need to have some level of awareness of where these things come from, how they're used. Non-numeric models, they don't necessarily um, give you a, a number, a figure, a number of pounds or a number of months or years or a percentage. But they, they give you some other way to assess um, a project. So, for example, the sacred cow model, a project is suggested by a senior and powerful official in the organization. Can you imagine a situation like that? Can you imagine you're working in an organization and somebody, some, some se somebody senior with some authority comes along and suggests a particular project? That project now has a level of credibility. It has a weight that's come about not because of it, its own value or its merit, but who suggested it, who's backing it, who's supporting it. So, operating necessity. This is one non-numeric model. The project is required to keep the organization running. Competitive necessity. A project is necessary to sustain a competitive position. Project line extension. The projects are judged on how they fit with the current product line, fill a gap, strengthen a weak link, or extend the line in a new desirable way. So sometimes a company needs to make a decision not based on how much money they'll be making, but simply operate, operating necessity, or what other products they already have and whether they can afford not to supply it. There's something called the comparative benefit model. Several projects are considered and the one with the most benefit to the firm is selected. Okay, we won't be looking at these in much detail. What we will be looking at is a non-numeric model called SWOT analysis. Now, I'm sure you will have come across this before, but SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that will form half of task number one. So SWOT analysis is really important. So SWOT analysis, it's an environmental or a situational analysis tool. So it's a method of strategic planning that allows you to evaluate these four components, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats involved in a project or a business venture. So after you've defined your long-term objective, what is it you're trying to achieve? then you need to look at these four aspects the strengths the weaknesses the opportunities and the threats so for example you're trying to construct a business a, a dinosaur park so that's your objective but what are your strengths what are your weaknesses what are the opportunities this gives you and what are the threats so you need to think about your objective you think you need to think about the internal and external factors that are favorable and unfavorable to achieving that objective. So you need to be realistic. So a SWOT analysis prevents you from starting on a venture which is doomed to failure. So remember we said environmental situational analysis and we said we need to look at the internal factors and the external factors. And by internal, we're talking about within the organization. So it could be a company, it could be a team, it could be a project. In your case, it'll be your uh, project team, but also your company, the, the, the contracting company that you're working for. So your company, you can look at your own strengths and your own weaknesses. The strengths, it could be attributes of, of particular people in the company, it could be your financial strength, it could be your competitive strength, your reputation, it could be your networking. It could be the equipment you have, the contracts you have. Your weaknesses, these are the attributes of the person or company or individuals or your equipment or reputation that are harmful in achieving that objectives. Now external factors, these relate 
to things outside the company or outside the organization. It could be market conditions. It could be competing companies. It could be the political situation. It could be the weather. It could be um, things like uh, the, uh, the, 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 the pandemic that we're living in at the moment. So threats, these are external conditions which could damage your objective. Okay, you, you're trying to do something, but there are things which can make that uh, difficult. There are things which could jeopardize um, these objectives. So these we consider external. They're not within our organization. They come from outside. Okay, and all of these, whether they're positive opportunities or negative threats, we need to be able to identify them. So two positives and two negatives. Opportunities and strengths, these are positives. And the weaknesses and threats, these are negatives. So we often use a little matrix for our SWOT analysis. So the two positives at the top, two negatives at the bottom. You have your internal, you have your external, you have your helpful, you have your harmful. Sorry, I said the two uh, positives are at the top. No, I meant the two positives are on the left, the strengths and the opportunities. And the two negatives, or the harmful, are on the right, the weaknesses and the threats. So this is one common way of putting together your, um, your SWOT analysis. And there are some nice tutorials, nice um, uh, guides online you can look at. And this QR code will take you to a website that is particularly helpful for this. So, why do we do a SWOT analysis? Remember, we were talking about models, and we said there are quantitative models and qualitative models, and SWOT analysis is one kind of qualitative or non-numeric model used for project selection. So the purpose is project selection. So carrying it out requires you to think carefully, thoroughly, and creatively about your situation. So it requires honesty. Now, aligning your strengths with your opportunities and aligning your weaknesses with your threats. Think about that for a second. Why would you align your strengths with your opportunities? So an opportunity is a positive external and your strength is your positive internal. And lining those up makes it more likely that you can achieve that positive opportunity. Similarly, if you have a weakness and you're aware of it internally and you have a threat externally, being able to acknowledge that um, possibility of the weakness lining up with the threat makes it more likely that you can avoid that happening. So aligning your weakness with your threat doesn't mean that we need to match our weakness to our threat, but it's the threat that exists. So our weakness is how that threat will affect us. So we need to either uh, work to avert, to strengthen, to mitigate that weakness, or some other way we need to protect ourselves as an organization from being vulnerable to that threat. So understanding that link between the, the weakness internally and the threat externally is really important. Now often in the um, workshops I'm asked about how to do this and how to do that and what's the correct way to do this and the correct way to do that and often answers I give will be very vague because the purpose of this whole idea of planning a virtual dinosaur park is A, to have a little fun because it's, a, it's an imaginary make-believe project and B, to learn about these concepts which we're covering in the lectures. So I don't want to be too prescriptive about it because we're not actually going to build the dinosaur park. So what I'm hoping for is thoughtful, creative, sensible answers 
that you can defend, that you can justify. So you might ask me, should we do it this way or should, I, should we do it that way? My answer will often be, do it however you want to do it, as long as you can justify it. Okay. The more creative you are, uh, the more imaginative you are, the more thoughtful you are, the more you will learn, the more fun it will be, and the better you'll do. So you shouldn't be thinking as a student. You need to think as a construction manager. So it's, it's all role play. So you need to start these meetings not as ELEC 352 project students or students. You need to start them as construction engineers. You need to think as project managers trying to achieve this uh, end task. And just by um, but by, by thinking of yourselves like that, you'll start behaving like that in the meeting and your minutes will reflect that and your documentation will reflect that and hopefully uh, it'll be a more productive um, experience. Now we've spoken about a project. One of the criteria of a project is it has to have some objective. It needs to try to achieve something. Now these objectives are what we're going to be looking at uh, next. And this is going to be your very first task, or task zero. So what do we want this project to achieve? Whether it's your final year project or any other project you want to do, you need to be trying to achieve something. So this, the answer to this question, what, would, what do we want to achieve, that forms something called the project objectives. The objectives is not what do I want to do, it's not how am I going to do it, it's what am I trying to achieve. So what is it at the end of the project that this project will have done? So good objectives, well-written objectives, usually have at least these five components. If you look online, there's often a sixth and a seventh and an eighth component added onto this, but the very minimum are these five criteria. And they're summarized in this um, acronym SMART. So S for specific, M for measurable, A for appropriate, R for realistic, T for time limited. So the A is sometimes achievable, appropriate, R for realistic, T for time limited. And we're going to go through those one by one. So a specific objective isn't general, it's not loose, it's not vague, it's very precise about what we're trying to achieve. Okay, so it's not a long-term strategic aim. A long-term strategic aim isn't an objective. An objective is something that you can either achieve or you don't achieve. And it's, if it's not specific, then it isn't an objective. So if I, if I join a tennis club and take weekly um, tennis lessons, and I say, this is my project for the summer. My objective isn't to improve my tennis skills. Improving my tennis skills isn't a very good objective because I won't ever know if I've achieved that objective. I could achieve that objective in half an hour or it might take me six months. I need to be specific. How good at tennis do I need to be before I can say I've achieved the objective? And it's important to set some kind of specific, precise requirement, some threshold, so that I can say I've spent £2,000 and I have failed. I haven't achieved my objective. It's important to have an objective so that you can achieve it or not achieve it. And this is where measurable comes in. You need to be able to measure it in some way. You can't say, I want to improve my uh, tennis skills um, by a factor of 10. 
But how are you going to measure that? You need to be able to, to measure it in some way. There needs to be some metric that you use to measure. It needs to be appropriate for your organization. So if it's a, a, um, a, a company that, that specializes in, um, in marketing, then the objective needs to be appropriate for the ethos and for the role of that organization. It needs to be realistic. So your project, you can't have a project to, um, to, to, to get to the moon in two years if your budget is half a million pounds. Half a million pounds isn't going to get you to the moon unless you have the human resources, the financial resources, the technical resources, and you have the infrastructure to be able to deliver that. So smart objectives, realistic, is important. You need to be specific, measurable, appropriate, realistic, and time limited. I want to be able to get a probe to the moon by June 2025. You need to specify a time. There needs to be a time by which you want to achieve that. Otherwise, the project will never achieve its objective because you can always say, yes, I'm almost there, we're almost there, we just need a little bit more work. And you'll never be able to say, we achieved it or we didn't achieve it. So we need to set a time limit. That time limit is generally the end of the project. Remember we said one of the criteria of a project, it needs to have a definite end time. So S-M-A-R-T. So you need always to consider A and R. So the appropriateness and the realistic nature of your project, you need to take it into account. You don't need to specifically, explicitly mention that it's appropriate, but it needs to be appropriate. So Greg's the Bakers, if they were to do a project to put a man on the moon, it doesn't match their business expertise. It's not what that pro company is about. And if NASA were to develop a new meat pie, unless it's a meat pie that's going to be consumed by astronauts, then it's not appropriate. Similarly, it wouldn't be realistic for a university motorsport team to enter the road car market because it's not their job. Uh, mechanical engineers, they're very good at what they do, but they won't have the, um, the, the resources to necessarily uh, build, uh, build vehicles on a large scale. So you need to be realistic and appropriate, but that doesn't necessarily show in the objective. It's something that's understood from the objective. But the other three, the S, M, and T, the, these need to be explicitly stated. So... T is time limited, the SMART objective has to mention the time. So for example, to increase awareness amongst 12 to 15 year olds of the dangers of AIDS in UK, from 12% to 25% by June 2017. That is a SMART objective. It's specific because they're talking about awareness of AIDS amongst 12 to 15 year olds. It's not just awareness of STDI, it's not awareness of AIDS in general, it's not awareness of AIDS in the UK, but it's specific. It's awareness of AIDS in the UK, the dangers of AIDS in the UK, in 12 to 15 year olds, and it's measurable. I'm not just going to say, I want to increase the awareness, I have to be able to say, how am I going to measure whether that has happened or not? And the answer is, I will measure it using some metric that they haven't included here, but they've, met, they, they've said that the awareness will raise from 12% to 25%. And they've mentioned the time, June 2017. So if by June 2017, this metric is invoked and we've only gone up to 21%, then that objective will not have been met because the objective was to raise it from 12%, where it currently is, to 25%. So anything less than 25%, the objective hasn't been met. 
So similarly, the next one, to increase the profit of a particular operation from this much to this much. So the time is included. The um, specific, it says the profit of our Brazilian operation, that's specific. Measurable, well, we can measure the profit in dollars from 200,000 to 400,000. That's very measurable, very specific. So that will count as a smart objective. So take a second to think about what's the smart objective for your final year project. The project that you will be doing, the project that you have already discussed with your supervisor. You probably discussed an objective, but it might not have been a smart objective. I want you now to think about making that objective smart. So look at these, for example. Which of these is a smart objective? So what you want to look for is all three components. They should have the, the five components, but look for the three that will be explicitly there. You need a date for the time, you need something that's specific, and you need something that's measurable. Now we're going to talk about this week's tasks. Task zero and task one. These are the very easy tasks, very short tasks, but you need to get them done very, very quickly. So task zero, you need to have this done by Friday. Task zero is to write a smart objective for your final year project. Not the dinosaur project, but your final year project, ELEC 340. I don't want one page, I don't want one paragraph, I don't want three sentences, I want one single sentence. You can use two, but there's no reason why you can't fit it in one single sentence. So think about what you are trying to achieve. Think about why it's important to achieve that, but do not think about how you're going to achieve it. So many people, many students, when trying to write their objective, they tell me what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. So using MATLAB, I will simulate such and such. That's not a smart objective. Nobody cares whether you're using MATLAB or anything else. Don't say, I will use a Raspberry Pi, I will use a Arduino, I will use C++. That's talking about how you're going to do something, and that's fine, but not for a smart objective. For a smart objective, you want to talk about what you are trying to achieve and why you're trying to achieve it. And try not to cram your objective with technical jargon because your objective will be read by someone who isn't necessarily an expert in your field. So your SMART objective will be assessed by another student in the class at random. So that other student might not know about all the, 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 the technical jargon that you will have or that you will be familiar with. So here's, here's, a, here's a good example, a SMART objective. So two, design, simulate, fabricate, and test. So those are four things that the student is going to do for their project. So I've highlighted it in green just to show that that's quite specific. He didn't just say to make an automatic fish food dispenser, no. He said to design, simulate in software, fabricate in hardware, and test. So the four things they're going to do an automatic fish food dispenser. So it's clear what they're trying to do. And they've been quite specific about it. It's a 200cc fish food dispenser with variable portion size. Now it's not enough to say variable portion size. Tell me, variable between what and what? Using off-the-shelf market, 
off-the-shelf market components with a total cost of less than 20. That's helpful because this particular project, um, I happened to be the supervisor at the time, the student wanted to do something that was cheaper than what was available on the market. So it was important to mention the cost. For your project, the cost might not be important. So don't mention the cost unless it's an important objective. To enable laboratory fish to feed on demand by swimming in a partitioned section of an 80 litre fish tank. Quite specific, isn't it? It doesn't just say, uh, to build an automatic fish feeder. No, it's to build an automatic fish food dispenser with variable portion size using this kind of components to enable a particular kind of fish to feed in a particular way in a particular kind of tank. Why? Why is that important? Why are we wasting our time building an automatic fish dispenser, food dispenser? That's the bit in blue. It's to reduce food wastage and improve fish welfare. That's important. That's where the appropriate comes in. S-M-A-R-T. That's where the A comes in. I'm trying to reduce food wastage and improve fish welfare. Now, how much am I going to reduce the food wastage? I need to mention by how much. It needs to be measurable. If I don't mention by how much, it's not a smart objective. I need to be able to measure it. So I've said by at least 15%. Now, if you mention by at least 15% or by at least 10% in your objective, it means you should be prepared to measure that, and then you should be prepared to actually um, achieve that, because that becomes an objective. And the final bit I've said by April 2021. So I've set a deadline. That's the time-limited nature. If I don't set the time-limited nature, it isn't a smart objective because it's missing the T. So this is an example of a smart objective. What's missing? The A, the appropriate. Now, is this an appropriate project? Well, in an electrical engineering department for a final year project student to be working on building an electronic feeder for fish, yes, that's appropriate because it's, it's an electronic device and it's um, it's, uh, it combines various aspects of mechatronics and robotics and uh, computer science. So it's perfectly appropriate. But I, there's not, I haven't needed to highlight it because it's, it's inherent, it's understood. The things you need to actually mention are the S, the M, and the T. The R, I would like you to include it in the objective because without it, um, it's not clear why you are doing it. But you don't always have an R in smart objectives mentioned explicitly. But for this task, I need the R. The R is very important. So this task you have to do this week. This is another example. So this is a software project, but again, it's got the specific nature. It's got the specific bit, the bit in green, to develop and deploy to the Apple App Store. So I didn't just say to develop an app or to write an app. That's not good enough. You have to say an app for which platform? And once you've done the app, how am I going to know it's an actual app? It needs to be on the Apple App Store. So that's the condition. That's very specific. What does it use and what does it do and how does it do it? I've mentioned that. It uses the true depth sensors to estimate in 10 minute intervals from live video stream the fatigue level of the driver of a vehicle using the 11 point shoulder fatigue scale. So it's specific. It's measurable because I'm using an 11 point fatigue scale. Why am I doing this? I'm saying that in blue at the bottom, providing a tool to help improve road safety by flagging unsafe driving. That's the R. That's why it's important. Is there a a time limit? Yes, I've said by the 20th of April 2021. That's very specific. I've mentioned the day that this needs to be completed by. So this is a good, smart objective. It combines all of these components. Okay, so I am asking you each to put together a single sentence, something like this, and upload it by Friday. 
it's really easy. It's the easiest five points or five percent, five marks that you'll ever get. All you need to do is write a sentence. And it's also the most useful 5%, the most useful sentence, because it'll help you understand your project. It'll, it's something you can put on your project specification and your interim report. You can present this at your project um, presentation in December. You can put this on the first page of your final project report in April. So this SMART objective is really helpful. It's helpful for the assessor to assess your project. It's helpful for your supervisor to see what you're trying to do. It's helpful for you so you can remain focused on exactly what you're trying to achieve and what exactly you need to satisfy in terms of the measurable criteria. If you don't write it down, then you'll never be certain that your project has been successful or not. So it might be during the course of the project that you need to go back and change these objectives. That's fine. But you need to start with a smart objective, not a loose, woolly, vague um, uh, objective, open to interpretation, but a smart objective. And I'm going to help you to get those marks for your project, I'm going to help you achieve a good project report by giving you 5% for simply writing out a set sentence that looks something like this. You don't need to highlight it. All you need to do is write a sentence. So that was task zero. Task one, that relates to your dinosaur project. And for that, you need to work together as a team. So you need to download the um, handbook, and you need to download the documentation of VITAL, and you need to work together as a team. What you need to do is, again, you need to write a SMART objective. So you've already had some practice writing SMART objectives. You're going to do another one. This time, the SMART objective will be for your project. You need to carry out a SWOT analysis for your project and the project this time we're talking about the virtual project the dinosaur part park and you need to write a 200 word analysis of these findings so I, you, you do the SWOT analysis and then you write 200 words 200 words is just a page of text so it's really 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 easy okay so everybody needs to do this you need to work together as a group everybody needs to submit deadlines, they're all on the module schedule. Okay, I've already stressed how important it is to do everything on time and to submit by the deadlines. So how to do well in this module? You need to think ahead, plan ahead, work with your group, be an active group member and not a passenger. If you're a passenger, your group will penalize you. You will lose marks for being a passenger. Submit your work on time. And remember, everybody needs to submit. If you don't submit, you just give up the marks for that task. If you're the project manager and you don't submit, your whole group pay, pays the price for you not submitting. So that was how to do well. If you want to fail in this module, just leave everything to the last minute. Because you won't have time. If you leave everything to the last minute, you try to, to rush everything to the last minute, you won't be able to get it all uploaded in time. You'll get to zero. If you leave the rest of the group to do all the work, the group will penalize you. You'll pay the price in the end. If you miss your submission deadline by a minute or by a second, immediate zero you've wasted an opportunity. If you fail to take self and peer assessment seriously, you get a zero. So when I ask you to, to upload your SMART objective for task zero, that will be marked by someone else in the class. Now, if when your opportunity comes to mark someone else's objective, if you don't take it seriously, if you just give them zero 
or just give them 100% without reading the criteria, without taking it seriously, without leaving feedback, then you will get the zero and the other person will get a mark that I will award them. So in order to, 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 to get the full mark, you need to both engage with the task and with the assessment of the task. And just to make it really, really clear, if you miss a deadline, it's an instant zero. No ifs, no buts, no negotiation, no tolerance. If you're the project manager and you miss a deadline, the entire group gets a zero. And if you abuse the self and peer assessment process, instant zero. Okay. Otherwise, it's really easy to do well in this module. Remember I said there are five tasks. Here they are again. Tasks 1, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. You need a project manager for each of these and a secretary for each of these. You can't do that without first arranging yourselves into groups. So you need to do that first. The first task really is to get yourself grouped up and there's a deadline for that of Friday. So it says upload completed document to Vital by midnight. That is wrong. Ignore that. Ignore the uh, 14th of October. It, the deadline is as cross that out and say as scheduled. Okay, so you upload task one as scheduled. The schedule is on vital. So remember I said we're going to be working in groups. The groups will be groups of five. You can either choose your own groups. Some people uh, know who they want to work with and you're welcome to do that. And some will want a random allocation of groups. So I've set aside the first 10 groups for self-selecting groups and the remaining 50 groups from 11 to 60, these are for random allocation. So you need to join a group this week. So if you're um, in groups one to 10, if you're self-selecting, you need to agree with your partners, choose a group number, say you're group six, for example, go to Vital, Elect352, Learning Resources, Project Allocation, Project Groups, Self-Enroll, go to group six, Click on that and you'll automatically be added to that group. If you click on a group, you can't go back. Once you've clicked on a group, you've joined that group. So make sure you don't just click to have a look. Only click once you're ready to join. We can't have less or more than five people per group. It's exactly five people per group. Okay, so what do you need to do? Today, you need to Assign yourself to a group. Do that by Friday. You need to upload your uh, objective. You can start today, add to it tomorrow, do a little bit more the day after tomorrow, but make sure it's finished by Friday. But don't leave it until Friday. Do something today just in case you run out of time, just in case you forget. At least you have something written. And it's only one sentence. So it shouldn't take you more than 15, 20 minutes to write it out. Have a chat with your supervisor, but once you've done that, think about it carefully and put down your SMART objective. Okay, so that's all for today. Good luck. I hope that goes well. I will meet you um, on Friday uh, for the workshop. I'll take any questions. If you have any questions until then, feel free to post them on the discussion board. I will try my best to address them.